to have Rote Marnon Friedman from uh, ETH Zurich, and she will talk about the vice independent randomness amplification and the uh, <laughs> Thanks, Ran. Um, yes, so I'm, I come from Switzerland, from the Institute of Theoretical Physics, so I brought you some chocolates. Um, you can keep it as dessert. Um, yes, so I'm from the Institute of Theoretical Physics, but uh, the things we do um, actually are related and relevant, and maybe you would even think that they are more computer science stuff. Um, so this is why I'm here giving a talk about it. Um, I will explain exactly what it means, device uh, independent randomness amplification and privatization. I assume you don't know anything about it, um, or about quantum cryptography in general. Um, but please ask me any questions. If something is not clear, then just uh, feel free to interrupt and, and just ask, okay? So my main goal will be just that you understand what the field is about and what is the task, and only later we will get into some details of the proof. Um, this is a joint work with, uh, with Max Kessler. He's a master's student at ETH. Um, and I will also uh, discuss uh, two different works that we used as tools for this work. Um, one of them is with uh, Frederick Dupi, Omar Fazi, Renato Renner, and Thomas Vidic. Uh, and the other one is with Christopher Portman and Volker Schultz. OK, um, so the outline of the talk, I will start by um, just explaining what is the task of randomness amplification and privatization. Okay, and then um, after discussing several possible protocols, we will get to the idea of device independent protocols. So I will explain what I mean by device independent, what is this framework about. This is a cryptographic framework. Um, then I will be able to explain uh, the protocol and the setting that we consider and uh, show you the results that we have. And hopefully I will have time also to discuss uh, some of the proof techniques. Um, this will include, include many uh, concepts that you're probably already familiar with. Okay, so entropies, uh, adversaries, extractors, so many things that you know from classical cryptography or the classical world. So it's not, um, I'm just trying to tell you that it's not completely uh, unrelated to from what you're doing. And maybe some of the tools can be relevant also in, in other contexts. Good. Um, so the motivation, it's kind of clear. We want to uh, talk about randomness in this work. So uh, randomness is used in many different, uh, many different questions in computer science. Um, so complexity classes, sampling problems, um, simulations, and in particular cryptography. Okay, so cryptography is uh, the most demanding application for randomness. And we will focus um, in, this, in this talk about on this uh, application uh, of randomness. Okay. Now, in cryptography, many, of the t many times we don't need any type of randomness, okay? but we actually need uniform private randomness. Okay? So this is not just something, uh, something general. Um, and what uh, I'm going to ask and to address in this talk is the following question is, can we create close to uniform uh, and private randomness from a weak public source of randomness? And to make it even more complicated, we will actually want to use just a single source of weak randomness. Um, just so we're, uh, we, we use the same words, so um, by weak, I mean that the bits uh, are biased and correlated with one another. So for example, one type of, uh, uh, of source, of a weak source of randomness, is the mean entropy source. Okay, so this is a source where we say the um, probability of the most likely string is, uh, is bounded. Okay, another type of source, uh, which has more structure, is the Santa Vazirani source, the SV source. Um, this source, you can think of it as um, a sequence of bits produced one after the other, okay? And each bit has some randomness in it, uh, given all of the previous values, okay? So it, it has more structure than the mean entropy because we, we know we have some randomness in each bit. Um, it only depends on the previous ones, okay? And um, in this work, we focus on, on the Santa Vazirani source, okay? Not on the general mean entropy source. Okay, uh, so this is weak, uh, uh, weak randomness. Public randomness, I mean that everyone can see the bits once they are produced. Okay, so for example, if you think of the NIST randomness beacon, then they produce some randomness, but then they put it online on the website. And once it's online, then everybody can go, can, can go on the website and see what it is. Okay, so in particular, you cannot use it uh, for cryptographic tasks because of course you don't have any, any security if everybody knows the, the keys. Okay, so this is what I mean by public, not that it's uh, completely predictable in advance, but just once it's there, then, um, then everybody can see it. Okay, and then uniform and private, this is uh, exactly the opposite. So, yeah, you understand what I mean by uniform and private. And the important thing is that uh, when I use these terms, then this is with respect to a quantum adversary, 
okay, which um, doesn't have any computational uh, um, any computational assumptions. Okay, so this is this uh, adversary can do whatever she wants. Okay, you don't need to understand exactly what quantum adversary means here. Uh, I will say something about it later if it's relevant. Okay, but this is just a very strong adversary. You can think about it this way. Okay, um, so what is the task? Uh, we have here, we start with a weak and public source. Okay, this is this uh, purple uh, string here. And we would like um, to end with a uniform and private source. So this is the green one. Okay, what we want to do is to find a protocol that will allow us to do um, this kind of process. Okay, so this protocol should be um, obviously deterministic. If we have a randomized protocol, um, then yeah, you can just get the uniform and private, uh, private um, bit string if you have some private randomness. So really this protocol should be deterministic. The only input of randomness is the, this weak and public source. And then we want to create this uniform and private source. Okay, so this is, this is the task. Okay, so the first thing we can consider is a classical protocol for this scenario, but um, this is impossible. So first of all, it's impossible to take a single weak source and to get um, to apply some deterministic function and to get a uniform source out of it. But even more, uh, the more intuitive problem is that if you start with something public and the protocol is completely known to everybody, there is no way you can get something private out of it. Okay, uh, the privacy must come from somewhere. Okay, so with classical protocols, we really there is no way to do such a such a thing. Okay, so if we can't do it with classical protocols, let's, let's go to quantum protocols. Um, so what is the most standard quantum protocol for this kind of scenario? It's the following. Okay, um, so what we have here, this is a photon. <coughs> it's a particle. Here in the middle, this, uh, this line here, this is called uh, a beam splitter. Okay, what it means is just that we have this photon, it goes to this beam splitter, and then when it reaches the beam splitter, it splits. Okay, so it either uh, continues to the, to the detector on top over there, uh, or it goes uh, down here. Okay, and now the detectors, they just click when they see a photon. Okay, and what we, uh, the protocol for this kind of scenario will be that if this detector clicks, then we uh, say that the output bit is zero, and if this detector clicks, then the output bit is one. Okay, so this is the, the quantum protocol in this case. Okay, now, um, Quantum physics, okay, basically tells us that there is a way to um, to set this kind of uh, scenario, this kind of experiment, okay, such that uh, it's completely undetermined, unknown whether the photon will go in this direction or the other direction, okay. So it's unpredictable, and you can really get 50% uh, zero and 50% one. And even more, it, uh, you can also set this such that there is no side information about this this uh, the outcome, okay. So it will really be completely uniform and private if you run this protocol. Okay, so that's um, a cool feature of, of quantum physics. So actually in this scenario what happens is that you don't even need a weak random source, you just have those photons and you create uniform and private uh, randomness out of it. Okay, so this will be even better than what I wanted to achieve. But there are some problems with this. So first of all, you know, if I go for, if I try to compare to the classical uh, protocol that I, I, I said it's impossible to have a classical protocol, then I can say the photons here are, in a sense, they are like private coins, right? I created the photons uh, in a specific setting, and this is why I can create the private coins out of them and get my, uh, my randomness. Okay, so this is, I would say, this, it's unfair to compare this kind of scenario. If I don't allow private coins, then I should not allow this kind of setting. But the more, um, the real problem with this kind of uh, solution, this kind of protocol, is that it's not really useful. Okay, the reason is that no one can actually go to the lab and prepare exactly this kind of setting. Okay, so we will always have some imperfections. The photons will not be exactly what we wanted. The detectors can be manipulated um, with, some, with some attacks, physical attacks. Um, and then what happens in practice that what, is, that what I said is no longer true. Okay, so um, the outputs are not 50-50% um, distributed, um, and there is some side information about these photons, about these, these outcomes. Okay, so in practice, we cannot, really, um, we cannot really, really use these kind of things. Okay, um, so just as a, as a like, side remark, okay, so I don't know how many of you, so this is Avi Vigdon, so, so I guess you know him, I don't know how many of you uh, saw his uh, public talk about randomness, Okay, he gave it many, many times. Um, so here, at some point in his talk, he asks, okay, where can we get true random bits from? Uh, he Googles it. And then here you can see there is actually a quantum uh, random number generator that it's doing exactly what 
uh, what I just described. Um, and these things are real. There are companies that, that build those things. So this is um, this device here. This is this uh, thing here. So you can, it's not very interesting. You can take a look. Um, but this is this black box. And now we can look at it and we can ask, okay, is it really working? Is it really doing what it's supposed to do? What I, I like the, this, uh, this picture that I showed you. And I mean, we can try to open it. Probably if we all even look at it together, we can't really tell uh, what's going on. So it's not really useful in the cryptographic setting, okay? And the question is, how do we solve this problem? How, ca how can we overcome this, um, these kind of problems? Okay, um, I don't know, <laughs> it's a box. If you plug it to the computer, then it will give you random numbers. Um, okay, so what is device-independent cryptography? Okay, the goal is exactly to solve this, um, this kind of problem. The motivation, um, is to bridge the gap between theory and experiment, okay? In the sense that we want to be able to accommodate noise in the implementations or imperfections, even if we don't know exactly which imperfections we have, okay? So even if I cannot really model uh, everything that goes inside this box, I still want to be able to uh, prove security, for example, okay? And the way to do it is um, to just assume less um, about the physical system when we prove security. Okay, so if we don't assume something about how, what, whatever is going on inside, okay, about the setting of the photons, of whether there are even photons inside, and if I manage to prove security, then um, in particular it will be independent of what's going on inside. Okay, so if there are imperfections, um, I don't care about it. The way to do it is to take uh, what we call the black box approach. <coughs> And this is basically what you, I guess, what you have in mind when, when you anyhow think of a black box in computer science. So you should think of it um, like this. We have this experiment. This, let's say this is what's going on inside this box. And we don't know what's going on. What, we don't know what, what is going on here, what, what is the output of this thing. Um, even more, it might be that you know, the experimental group that created this kind of thing, uh, or the company, um, they are malicious. Okay, So they programmed things here. They, they manipulated things such that they will know the outcome, although they claim it's random, and you don't, I mean, we cannot tell by looking at this uh, complicated thing. So what we are going to do is we are going to put it in a black box. Okay, and by putting it in a black box, we basically forget everything uh, that we know about it. And now we are only going to have uh, classical interactions with this black box. Okay, so what do I mean? I, I mean that now I have a classical computer that basically tells the experiment what to do. Okay, so the, the, the producer of this, uh, of this box give it to me together with a computer that I can push buttons, okay? Um, so I, I push a button, I, I give the input zero, and then something is going on here. I have no idea what it is. And then the computer, there is some kind of result. The computer gives me one, okay? And then I, can, I continue the interaction like this, and this is what I mean by classical interaction with this uh, black box. Okay. So... Um, what is, how does a device-independent uh, quantum cryptography protocol look like? It's the following thing. We have um, some honest parties, okay, and they share this uh, unchar uncharacterized device, so this uh, black box that we had here, and it's, it can also be malicious, this back black box. Now we, they will have some protocol, okay? This is just a classical protocol that tells them how to interact with this box. So the entire interaction is classical. So this is what we call a device-independent protocol. And then in the end of the interaction, either the uh, honest parties decide to abort if they are not happy from, uh, with what they see. And if they don't abort, then we say that they accomplish uh, a certain cryptographic task. Okay? Good. So we can think of this, uh, of this box as one resource for the protocol, and the protocol is going to tell us how to interact uh, with this resource. Okay. Um, so back to our task, we have a weak public source. We now want to find the device-independent quantum protocol that will use this box as a resource uh, and will output a uniform private uh, bits. Okay? Now, if we have such a thing, uh, this is what I will show you, then first of all, I would say that uh, here we, don't, we cannot really say that we have private coins. Okay? The reason is that I already assumed that the adversary gives me the box. Right? So there isn't anything private in the, in the normal sense. Uh, in this box, okay? Um, the second thing is that it is robust now, okay? So even if something goes wrong, I don't care. Either, either the protocol aborts if the implementation is not good enough, and if it did not abort, I don't care what's going on inside, um, the security will be, uh, will be fine, okay? So all of those of, uh, both of these problems are 
solved when we go to this device independent approach. Okay, now um, it turns out that we cannot really have a device independent uh, protocol with just one device, with just one box. Uh, we will need to have two boxes. Okay, but once we have two boxes and we can, um, <coughs> we can restrict the communication between these two boxes, okay, then uh, we will already be able to, um, to devise such a protocol that uh, we will be able to prove security. Okay? Now, um, this should seem uh, weird to you. Okay? I have a box, I don't know what's going on inside. How is it even possible that I can get something out of it? Um, so now I will explain how, what is the like, main ingredient, how these kind of things can work. Okay? And it will be related to quantum physics. Yes. So you said that you cannot use one, is it a theoretical limitation that you know about? Or is it yes, yes. So, so, yes. so I, uh, I'll explain now what is the main ingredient. Um, and why, yes, why we need this kind of thing. The intuition is somewhat that if you have just a single box, then everything that's going on, you, can, you cannot know if there is a piece of, it doesn't matter how you will interact with it. It might as well be that there is a piece of paper that tells it exactly what to do, and this piece of paper, um, the adversary also knows it. Okay, in a way, this you can think of it also as the, the two prover setting. So there are some things that you can do with two provers and not with just one prover. So the, the box will be the prover in this sense. Okay, so we need, we need two provers and we need uh, to make sure they don't communicate and then we can basically uh, do something. Okay. Maybe I'll, I'll say something about it uh, later as well. <coughs> okay, so the, the main ingredient that we need to have is uh, what we call a bell inequality <coughs> or a bell game. This is a type of a multiplayer game. Okay, again, in the sense that you maybe have in mind uh, from just classical computer science. Um, so here we have my, my device, I, have, I had two boxes, now these two boxes are this, um, this box, this is part of the box, and this is the other part of the, uh, of the box, so these are the two black things, okay, and um, I think of it as having two different honest parties, and each one of them has this um, a part of the box, okay, so Alice has a part of the box and Bob has a part of the box. Um, they can make sure that these two parts uh, ca cannot communicate when they need to make sure that they do not communicate. Okay, and now they have classical interaction with those boxes, right? So um, Alice, for example, will input a bit X and she will get an output A. These are just classical values. Um, and Bob will input Y and will get an output B. <coughs> okay, now we can define a game and the goal of this box will be to win the game. So Alice and Bob will choose some inputs according to some distribution defined by the game. And then there is, uh, the game will be defined with um, with some winning condition. Okay, so we say that the box uh, wins the game um, if this function of, uh, of a, b, x, y is equal to one. Okay, and the box loses the game if it's zero. Yes? Is there a Sorry? Can there be a time Yeah, right now we don't say anything about what's going on inside the box, but this, this will be crucial for later on. Okay, but right now the point is that yeah, we have those devices, we don't know what's going on, we define a game, and then we want to know whether the, the device wins the game or not, or what is the probability to win the game with this device. Okay, the device you can think of it as a, if you're, if you're familiar with multiplayer games, that you can think of the device as, as the strategy for the game. Okay, and this strategy can be classical or quantum or anything else. Okay, so once we fix the game, we can talk about the winning probability of the device. Okay, this will be a number between uh, zero and one. And then uh, we can talk about a bell inequality. Okay, so what is a bell inequality? A bell inequality is basically a condition that says for any classical strategy, for any classical device, the winning probability is um, upper bounded by a certain value i. Okay? If you want to have some kind of a picture in mind, you can look at this. So let, let's say that this, um, this square here, this is the set of all classical strategies. Okay? So these are all the possibilities, uh, all the possible implementation of classical uh, devices of these two boxes. And the bell inequality, you can think of it then as um, this line here that basically says, okay, all classical strategies uh, achieve up to this value in the, in, in the winning probability of the game. Okay, so all classical strategies are below this, uh, below this line, okay? Then uh, a quantum advantage in the game or a quantum violation of the bell inequality basically says that there is a quantum strategy Okay, so the device will have some shared entanglement um, such that the winning probability of this quantum strategy will be greater than this, uh, than this i, than this value. Okay, so in our picture you can uh, now think of 
uh, all possible quantum strategies. This is a larger set than the classical ones. Okay, so with quantum strategies, we can do more than classical strategies. And the, uh, the quantum advantage means that there is a point somewhere here which is above this line. Okay, so it can do better than anything that classical, uh, classical strategies can do. Now, the important thing for cryptography is that um, we can show, and I, I will show you soon uh, exactly what I mean about it, we can show that once we have a quantum violation of the Bell inequality, then this implies that um, there is some private randomness in the output uh, of the player with respect to a quantum adversary. Okay, so this, this will be the most important thing that we will use later on to show that we can, we can create private randomness. So, so let me explain it with an example. So the most famous uh, Bell inequality or Bell game is the CHSH game. Um, we have our two devices here. Um, the inputs are just bits and then the winning condition is this, in this value here. If it's satisfied, then uh, they win the game and otherwise they lose. So this is just a simple game. If you think about it for a little bit, you will see that the best classical strategy that you can come up with uh, will achieve winning probability of 75%. Uh, percent. Okay, so this is the best you can do with a classical strategy. On the other hand, there is a quantum strategy that will allow you to win this game with around 85%. Okay, so there is it, a quantum strategy which is better than any classical strategy. Okay, and therefore we have a quantum advantage here. How is this related to secrecy, to the, to the private randomness? So what we see here is, uh, uh, is a plot. This was derived by uh, Peroni et al. almost a decade ago. Um, here on the y-axis, we have the entropy of A. This is Alice's output. Given x, y, those are the inputs of Alice and Bob. And E, this is the side information of the adversary. Okay, so you can think of it as classical side information or quantum side information. Um, this is yes, because things can be a, a quantum here, so this is called the von Neumann entropy, it's just an extension of the Shannon entropy. Okay, so you can keep whichever intuition you have for the Shannon entropy, uh, it, it's fine here. And this basically describes how random A is from the perspective of the adversary Eve. Okay? Um, on the other axis, we have the winning probability in the CHSH game. Okay, and what you can see here is that um, so we said 75%, this is the best a classical strategy can do. And then if we have a classical strategy, then the entropy is zero. Why? Because everything could be determined in advance and the adversary just knows exactly what the device is going to do. So we cannot get any, uh, any private randomness out of it, obviously. And what you see on the other uh, end is that if we have the optimal quantum strategy, then we have full entropy. Okay, so A is a bit, so full value is, is entropy of one. So the adversary doesn't know anything about this bit, it's completely a completely a random and private. And in the middle we have this kind of, uh, this kind of relation. Okay, so as the winning probability gets higher and higher, we can certify more and more uh, secret randomness. Okay, and this is, um, this is the crucial tool that, that we will use uh, later on to prove security. Okay, this is why we can, we can actually do it. Um, and maybe to go back to your question from before, and then um, if you have just a single device, then you can never know if it's, it's a classical and then you will always be here. Okay, so we have to see some advantage in a Bell violation, in the Bell game, uh, in order to say, okay, whatever is there must be quantum because classically I cannot get there. And once it's quantum, then we know that we can get some, some secrecy out of it. Okay, <coughs> um, any questions so far? So he can be tangent to, to both devices, right? Yes, yes, he, he can have um, entanglement with, with Alice and Bob, yes, yes. Okay, this is the, like the most important thing to understand about device independence, so no questions. Good. Okay, so <coughs> let's get back to, uh, to randomness amplification and privatization protocol. Um, so again, this is our task. We want to, to start with a weak public source, use two devices. Okay, we'll have some protocol which is based on this violation of Bell inequalities, of winning probabilities in Bell games. And then we want to create the uniform and private randomness. Um, let me just say a few words uh, about previous walks. Uh, I assume you don't know any of them, um, so I'll just I'll try to be brief about it. Um, maybe the important thing to understand is that um, there isn't just one model or one protocol. Okay, so there are different protocols in different walks. Um, so I cannot put it on one line and say this walk is better than the other one. Uh, what I can do is to uh, at least choose uh, three parameters that, that I care about. Um, I can explain why I care about it. 
and um, then show you how different walks um, go around with these parameters. So the first thing that I care about is I want to have a constant number of devices. Okay, so the number of devices, I mean the number of, of boxes, of these black boxes that I have. And the reason I want it to be constant and not, for example, polynomial in the number of bits that I'm going to take from the source is because I want, I want to be able to implement this kind of uh, protocol. Okay, now if I have too many devices, it means that I also need to make sure that they do not communicate with one another. Then basically a polynomial number of devices means that this entire, uh, like in each room here I will have a computer uh, and, and I will need to run the protocol with all of them and make sure that they, don't, they cannot send signals and it, wi it will get you know, unpractical. Um, so I will want to have a protocol with a constant number of devices. The other thing that I will want to have is that I want my protocol to be truly robust to noise. So by this I mean that in the honest implementation, okay, in the, in the completeness side, I want to be able to have a protocol that will not abort even if there is some noise. Okay, so by this I mean, okay, I can have a protocol that always aborts and it's definitely secure, but it's not really useful, right? So I need, I need to be able to somehow actually implement and make sure that, that the protocol does not abort. And when I go to implement, um, to implement my protocol, then again in the, in the lab, in the experiment, they cannot really make things perfect. Okay, so if, I, if I, I base security just on the assumption that I have perfect quantum violation, this 85%, then most likely that in every, you know, every time that I use my device, it will abort and then it's not useful. So I want to be able to say that even if I have noise, I don't want to abort. Okay, so this is what I mean here. Um, the third thing is to have a non-vanishing efficiency. So efficiency here, <coughs> sorry. Um, refers to how many bits I extract compared to how many bits I, I took from the source. Okay, and I want it to be non-zero, um, again, because I want it to be useful. Um, there are other parameters that we can consider, but I would say these are the most important ones uh, to keep it simple. And now these are the, uh, the, the main, uh, main walks that were uh, there before. So the first one was here by uh, uh, Kolbeck and Renner. Um, they gave the first, the first walk, they considered um, SV source that had only restricted bias. So they cannot work with any SV source, but um, until a certain bias, they are fine. Okay, they used, uh, a, they used two devices, which is the best, uh, the best you can hope for, um, but they were not robust to noise uh, and the efficiency was zero. Um, then this work, Gaelo et al, they improved. Uh, upon this one, now they can consider any bias, but um, they needed to use polynomial number of devices. Um, later, there was another work by Brandau et al. They achieved all of all these parameters, uh, which is great, but they had to use a private source. Okay, so um, the initial source of roundness, the SV source is private, not, uh, not public, so it's a different setting. Two other works um, by Chang, Shi, and Wu, um, they consider they are the uh, only works that consider mean entropy source instead of a, uh, instead of a SV source. Um, this one is with quantum adversary, this is with non-signaling adversaries, never mind. Um, they have here a polynomial, here exponential number of devices, um, and they can, they can tolerate it, a small amount of noise, okay, but not really a lot of noise. Okay, uh, our work, what I'm going to show you, lies exactly here. Okay, so we, have, uh, we can work with any, any, uh, any bias of the SV source, public source, and still achieve all of these, uh, all of these parameters. Okay. Uh, so what is the setting and the protocol that we have? We start with this public SV source, okay? And you can think of this public SV source again as bits that um, it's, there is some chronological order, so the bits are produced one after the other, okay? And then there is a certain uh, point in time in which the adversary will prepare the device and give it to the honest parties, okay, to Alice. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, until that point in time, um, we denote all of the previous bits, all of the history by lambda. This is just a classical value that describes everything that happened before the adversary prepared the device. And now when, advers <coughs> when the adversary makes the device, she can, um, she can make the prepare the device depending on this history because everything is public, right? So she, the device depends on lambda and she can also keep some side information, quantum side information for herself uh, on the side. Okay, so she creates a box and she keeps something for herself that she, will, she can use later. Now, um, Alice, Alice or Alice and Bob, they would like to use those boxes. Um, so we, we create now a device independent protocol. Okay, so the protocol is the following. So um, 
as I said, everything is based on this bell inequality. So the first thing that they will do is to play a bell, in, a, a bell game. Okay, it will not be the CHSH, but, but something related. Um, they will play the bell game uh, n times, one after the other. Okay, so they want to play one game, then the other game, then the other game, um, and they're going to do it. They need inputs to play the game, so they're going to take the inputs from um, the next bits here. Okay, so they take the next bits from the source, and then they use them as the inputs uh, x and y to these boxes. Okay. Once they use the boxes, then the, the boxes give them uh, the outputs, O. Okay, so this is now a string of outputs. Now they can use the inputs and outputs. These are just classical, classical bits. They can now check in each game whether they win or lose the game. Okay, and then they can calculate uh, the average winning probability or like uh, how many games they won. If they win a uh, sufficiently amount of games, then they are fine. If they see that the, the, the winning probability is too low, then they just abort the protocol. Okay, they say, okay, the boxes are probably, they don't do what I need them to do, I, I, I stop the protocol. Okay, so if they did not abort, then we continue to the next stage. The next stage, we take uh, additional bits from the, the next bits from the source. So this, we call them the seed Z. And now they are going to apply an extractor. Okay, it's a special type of two source extractor, I will uh, explain later. They will apply this extractor on, uh, on the outputs and on the seed uh, O and Z. Okay, and this will give them then the final, uh, the final key, uh, the final randomness K, um, which we, we claim is close uh, to uniform and private randomness, okay? So this is, uh, this is the structure of the protocol. The, maybe the most important thing here is indeed that we have this uh, chronological order, okay? So we have some point in time where we have these, uh, these lambdas, then we take the inputs and the next bits are then Z, okay? So first the inputs, then Z uh, are created. Okay, we will use this structure later on. Good. Um, so we have this setting and the, this protocol and what is the uh, statement of the theorem. So um, what we're saying is that given any uh, public as resource, there exists a device independent randomness amplification protocol that requires only two devices. Okay, so the interaction is only with two devices such that we have these two parts. So the completeness part um, says that there exists an honest implementation uh, of this device um, such that the protocol does not abort with high probability uh, even in the presence of noise. Okay, so this is what I, I said. I want the protocol to be non-trivial in the sense that I can go to the lab and actually implement it. So this is the completeness part. And the soundness part um, says that for any device uh, used to implement the protocol in the se uh, setting that I explained, either the protocol aborts with high probability um, or a close to uniform key is produced. Okay, so this is the part where I basically say, okay, the, the adversary gave me a different box, either I abort or I'm fine, I still have my secure key. Okay? So just to be slightly more explicit here, so we, yeah, we should have some kind of a security definition uh, to work with. So um, this is what we have. It's kind of similar to maybe what you have in mind from classical, uh, classical cases. So here, first, this is the probability, um, the, pr the probability of not aborting. Uh, Yes. So he, either the, the, uh, the probability of not aborting is extremely small, okay, in this case I still have security, um, or we have this kind of relation. So this is the trace distance. You can think of it as statistical distance, okay? It says whether two things are close to one another. Here I have, uh, it's a quantum state, but again, you can think of it as, as probability distributions. Um, we have here the, the final state on the, of the key, okay, of every, the outcome of the, of the extractor. And here, this is this, all of the side information. Okay, so it includes the quantum side information of the adversary, then the inputs, that all, all of the things that came from the public as we saw. So the input, uh, the seed Z and lambda, the history. Okay, so this is all of the side information. And we would like this to be close to a uniform, a uniform string, okay, which is completely independent of all of the side information. Okay, and, um, then we want this, uh, this distance to be small. So this is here the parameter, the security parameter in a sense. Okay, um, now this parameter uh, will obviously depend on the bias uh, of the source that we, uh, that we use uh, and the parameters of the extractor that we use. Um, this will determine this epsilon. Okay, but this is, this is the security definition. It's, it's basically an extension of, of security definitions um, that you see in, in classical extractors, for example. Okay. Um, some quantitative advantages that I can, I can also show you. So first of all, I said the device requirement uh, is only two, uh, two component device, which is minimal. Um, the robustness side, we can tolerate the maximal amount of noise. 
Okay, so it means that as long as there is a violation of the Bell inequality, as long as we are we are sure that we are quantum, then we are fine. We can still we can still uh, we can still have a protocol that will not abort with high probability. Um, regarding the extraction rate, the efficiency of the, of the protocol. So this will depend obviously on the chosen extractor. Okay, so that we, for the extractor, we have a trade-off between the parameters, the security and the length of the output, for example. So the efficiency will depend on this, but uh, it, is, it is possible to extract linear amount of bits while still maintaining um, cryptographic security uh, if we have a, a, an extractor which is good enough. So I will show you later, the entropies are linear, so, um, so it, it, it is possible. Um, Maybe just one comment is that in previous works, they also used extractors. It's kind of natural to use extractor, but they had zero extraction rate independently of the extractor. So it doesn't matter which extractor they use, they will always have zero efficiency. Okay? Um, so, so this is um, <coughs> here as well. Obviously, it depends on the extractor, but it, it, is, already, um, it is already better, much better. Okay. Um, so again, it's kind of clear we, we are going to apply an extractor. So for the extractor to work, we need to have uh, enough mean entropy in the two sources of the extractor. Um, so for the seed, we will have enough mean entropy because it comes from the SV source. Um, and for the output, we, we now, major part of the work is to show, to calculate the amount of mean entropy that we have in this output. Okay, so there, um, yes, we don't, we don't use O notation. We have the, the explicit rate. Uh, the first reason is because we can. Um, the second reason is because we actually, if you want to have an implementation, then O notation is not good enough. We need to have the exact values. Um, so let me just um, show you, explain what we see here. Okay, so um, on the y-axis, we have here the entropy rate. So this is uh, basically the smooth mean entropy. It's, it's related to the mean entropy um, of all of the outputs, O, given the uh, the, the side information, the quantum side, the quantum side information, um, the inputs, and lambda. And this is divided by n. This is the number of rounds of the protocol. So this is the entropy rate, okay? Um, and what we see on the other axis, this is, you can think of it as the winning probability. We use a different Bell inequality. So this is basically the Bell violation. It's how much better I'm doing than the classical case. Okay, and um, now the different, uh, the different curves here, they, um, they describe different number of rounds. Okay, so as the number of round, uh, rounds increases, we can certify more and more uh, randomness. This is obvious because of uh, just finite statistics arguments. Okay, if we have, uh, if we have uh, 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 not a lot of, of rounds, then even just because of the estimation, I cannot, I cannot say much. This uh, dashed curve here, this is the um, asymptotic IID rate. So I will explain later what IID means, but asymptotic means n goes to infinity. Um, so this is, in particular, this is an upper bound on, on what we can get here. And you can see that the number of round, uh, round increases that we, we go to this, um, to this asymptotic rate. <coughs> and as well as the, as the violation uh, of the Bell inequality increases, we get more and more entropy. Okay, so this particular plot is for, uh, actually for an, an unbiased SV source. Okay, so there is some other parameters, but this is exactly the case of uh, uh, unbiased, so perfectly uniform randomness to begin with. Um, when we have, when things are biased, then obviously we can certify less and less uh, randomness. Okay, so what uh, we see here is a different slice. So here I fixed the number of rounds. So this is, now we have 10 to the eight. Um, and the different curves now, they describe different sources, so different bias of the sources. And you can see um, indeed that um, when we have more and more bias, then we can certify less and less randomness. The important thing is that, um, independently of the bias, we will always have, we will always be able to certify something. Okay, so we always have a linear rate, but just this linear thing will, will get smaller and smaller, depending on the bias. Okay, um, any questions? So, I, uh, uh, well, ideally, in order to, like the honest implementation, they will use an entangled pair in, in every round. How do they, <coughs> hmm? they, um, they are distributed during the protocol. Okay, so you can think of it as having a source of photons, which is, um, which is controlled by the adversary. Okay, and the, this, um, what happens in this, in this setting is that just uh, you send more and more photons for every round. Okay, so this, hmm? to the boxes, yes, this is our, these things are uh, implemented. Of course, maybe later on you could also say uh, all of the photons are then to be there to begin with. This is 
currently it's just too hard. So the way they do it is by just sending one off to the other um, and the security proofs, they, they take this into account. So it's not a problem for security, the fact that um, these photons are... No, so every time first you send the photons and then you take the bits from the source to choose for the, <coughs> for the inputs. More questions? Good. Okay, so I have some time left for the proof techniques. Um, so first let me explain what are the pieces of, of the puzzle. Okay, so we have three pieces here. Um, first we will need a, a bell game, okay, a specific bell game that will allow us to define this protocol here. And this, uh, this game, basically what we want from it is to be able to accommodate the fact that the inputs and the boxes are correlated via this lambda, right? So since we have an SV source and the inputs can depend on the history and also the box depend on the history, so we need to, to make sure that we can uh, accommodate for this. The second thing that we need to do is to a way to bound the entropy here. So we need a way to derive those plots that I just showed you, okay? Um, and the third thing is that we need an extractor. Um, it will be kind of a two-source extractor, but you can see that what happens here is that O and Z are not independent of one another. Okay, they're correlated through this history, and therefore we cannot just apply a two-source extractor that assumes independence right away. Okay, so we will have we'll need to have a special type of extractor here. Okay, I'll start with this uh, third piece of the puzzle. It's the easiest uh, to explain. It's maybe the closest thing to things you already know. Um, so this is uh, the, the extractor that we use. This is uh, from a work um, with Christopher Portman and Volker Schultz. It's a quantum proof multi-source randomness extractors uh, in the Markov model. So let me explain uh, this result. <coughs> so what we see here, this is just the definition, the start definition of a two-source extractor. I just write it in the, in the quantum formalism here. So let me explain. Um, everything is classical here. So we have two sources, X and Y, uh, which are independent. Um, two classical sources. I just write them in, in quantum states, but you can think of it as just probability, uh, probability distributions here, and they are in product with one another, meaning that they're independent. And then we want the mean entropy of, of X and the mean entropy of uh, Y to be um, sufficiently high. And then the, uh, the definition of extractor says that, okay, it is extractor if uh, we have this condition. So uh, again, this is an extension of the, of the statistical distance. So here we have the output of the extractor um, and we measure the distance from a uniform output. Uh, and in the case of a strong extractor, we want it to be close to uniform, even given one of the sources. Okay, so this is just um, the standard definition of two source extractor. Now the question is, okay, how do we extend it uh, to the case where we have side information? Okay, so uh, both classical and quantum side information, we need to somehow think what is the correct model for this kind of thing, because we have now the two sources. Um, so in order to do this, we first, what we did was first to say, okay, the fact that they are in product, it means that uh, the mutual information between X and Y between the two sources is zero. This is just this entropic quantity here. So it, it's exactly the same as saying that they are uh, in product with one another. This is just a different version. But once we have this, uh, it's kind of an obvious guess on how one can extend this is the following. It's just saying that the conditional mutual information is zero. So it means that condition on the side information Z, um, it's, it's not the same Z that I had before. Um, so condition on the side information Z, I want them to be independent. Okay, so the, for the, from the point of view of the adversary, they're independent. Um, and the, con the conditional mean entropy uh, should be uh, high. Okay, so this is now the extension that we, ca that we consider. And then again, um, here we have, for example, in the, in the strong extractor case, we want it to be close to uniform, even given a, a one of the sources and the side information Z. <coughs> okay, so this, this is a very um, simple extension to side information. Okay, we call it the uh, quantum Markov model, so Z can be quantum, uh, or you can also stick with classical, um, just because this condition, it means that this is a Markov chain, it's just a name. Um, it's a natural extension of, of uh, product side information, which was previously, previously considered in, uh, by Kasher and Kempe. So product side information basically means that there is some side information, Z1 about X and Z2 about Y. Okay, and they're completely uncorrelated, so this is just an extension of it. Um, it's very simple. I don't know how no one did it before. Um, it is interesting for applications. Okay, so first of all, I will show you how we use it in the, in the randomness um, amplification context, but maybe even a 
more simple application is that I, I gave this talk in a quantum cryptography conference and then someone came to me after the talk and, and he's working in a company that creates a, a quantum random number generator chips and they have they produce the chips and they have a card where they want to put the chips on this card and they have enough space on the card that they can actually put two two chips okay and when it's not an adversarial setting so when the, when they have the two chips when they build them they are completely independent um, and they want to put them on the same card and now they said okay if i have two of them why don't i just apply an extractor to get better randomness okay but because they are now on the same card and they're connected to the same electricity, then now because of fluctuations in electricity, um, these, the two random number generators, they become correlated. Okay, now they cannot apply a two-source extractor. But this model is exactly fits to this, to this kind of problem because the side information, you can think of it as the fluctuations in the current. Okay, and now given those fluctuations in the current, the two sources are independent. Okay, so in the, all of the correlations come from the, from the current. Okay, so now they can use these kind of extractors uh, and everything is fine. Good, so uh, I hopefully I convinced you that the, the model is interesting. Um, then the question is, okay, are there good extractors in this model? Um, and the answer is yes, actually all two source extractors, all normal two source extractors uh, actually also work uh, in this model. So <coughs> for the classical case, the statement is uh, pretty state straightforward. So <coughs> any, uh, any uh, two source extractor is also a, a classical proof. So also when we have classical side information, um, that falls in the, in the Markov model and it's al it also works. We have a slightly decrease uh, change in the parameters. Um, this is a standard change in the parameters, like uh, basically every time that you take into account classical side information, this is, this is what happens. So all, ex uh, all the extractor works, um, that's nice. Then when we go to the quantum case, then um, we can still have the same reduction. So we still say that all of the extractors uh, work <coughs> in this case when we have quantum side information. Um, the mean entropy again should be slightly, just slightly higher, but the error of the extractor now um, gets much, um, much larger. Okay, so we have a blow up in the error. M here is the number of output bits of the extractor. Um, interestingly, if you have just a single output and this exactly, um, uh, this retrieves exactly the same uh, results that were known before um, for, for one output bit extractors. We don't know if this is tight, we don't know if it's, this is necessary, this is just a general reduction. Um, there are some specific constructions where you can show that this is not necessary, uh, but we don't know if in general this is needed or not. Okay, so uh, again, all the extractor works, we have some loss in, in parameters, um, but still, this can still lead to good extractors. Okay, so um, if, we have, if we have a good uh, two-source extractor, then here we can still end up with parameters which are fine for us in the, in the two-source case. Good, so uh, back to our setting. Um, so <coughs> first you should note that because we have this chronological order, then O and Z are independent condition on E, I, and lambda. Okay, so you can see it, this is like the common path that they share, right? Um, so indeed this is every, any, uh, er, the, all the correlations come from this kind of thing. Okay, so we have this uh, conditional mutual information being zero. Um, the mean entropy of Z is, um, we can calculate it from the source, okay? The smooth mean entropy of O, we can calculate it. We, we, th these are the plots that I showed you, okay? So we, we get it. Um, the extractors also work when we have smooth mean entropy, okay? So this is also something that we proved in the previous work. Um, so now it means that the extractor work and this is how we get this final statement here, okay? So that's a, the extractor work and this is what it means, that, um, that the output will be close to uniform with respect to the side information. So this is a, a strong extractor in the Markov model. Good. A any questions about this? <coughs> okay. Um, should I continue slightly? Okay. Okay. Um, so the first piece of the puzzle is now the, the Bell inequality that we need to choose that, that will accommodate the correlations. So this I will just give you a, like a rough intuition of what's going on. Um, so in the CHSH case, uh, we have these two boxes and the inputs are completely uniform and independent of the, of the boxes. Um, this is how the CHSH inequality is defined. Um, what happens is that now we have correlations, right? The box and the inputs are correlated via this, uh, via this lambda. If we want to work with the CHSH case, then because of these correlations, now classical strategies can do better, right? So we need to make somehow to modify the inequality. Um, we modify it by making basically the condition harder, 
Okay, so we don't want classical strategies to be able to cheat us, so we, we, make, we, we, we make it higher. The, the winning condition should be, should be higher, the winning probability should be higher. And if you continue with this approach, then at some point you get for a bias which is not the maximal bias of an SV source, um, you get that this inequality is so, like, so high here that even quantum things cannot, uh, cannot violate this inequality. Okay, so you basically it means that you cannot implement a protocol. Okay, so this, this approach is, uh, is good, it gives you the intuition of what happens, but it's not, it's not very useful if you want to work with any SV source. Um, what we're using is a different, um, different inequality, a new inequality uh, by, by uh, Putz et al. Uh, it's called the Measurement Dependent Locality, MDL, and this, this inequality, um, they already derived it for this specific uh, setting where there is this dependency with lambda. Okay, and this inequality, you can, what you can imagine is that you have this line here, and this line basically, if there is no bias, it's exactly like the CHG edge, and then when the bias increases, it moves in this direction. Okay, and it doesn't matter how much, uh, like until the maximal bias, it will, be, it will be right here on the top, but there will always be some point here on the quantum set that will still violate it. Okay, so this is a, it's a very nice inequality, it's a bit different, uh, but it fits perfectly to this, uh, to this setting. Okay, so this is the MDL uh, inequality. Um, so what they did in this work is this was more like a foundation uh, questions in physics, whether we have this kind of inequality that can work for any bias of the source, um, but they did not discuss anything which is related to, to the, the application cryptography. Okay, so uh, what was missing is uh, can we now certify private randomness from the violation of this inequality? What, how much uh, the adversary doesn't know about the output if we see a violation? Okay, so this is uh, the first thing what we did was to say yes, you can uh, you can certify uh, randomness. Um, so these are the plots here. This is it's not a protocol. Okay, it's just saying okay, if I have this box that has this winning probability, this violation of the Bell inequality, how much entropy I get from it? So you can see, oop, sorry, um, you can see here uh, two plots. Okay, now you can see them. Uh, so you can see here two plots. So this here you see it for the different uh, bias of the sources, how much entropy we can, uh, we can get. Uh, here you see it basically as a function of the bias of the source. Um, so <coughs> you can, this is the, like the case where it's completely biased, the source, and this is the case where it's completely unbiased, and this is the amount of entropy, the maximum of amount of entropy that we can certify using our technique. Um, Okay, so uh, the way to do this is basically by a reduction to the, to the case of the CHSH that I showed you that was already known before. Um, let's skip this. Um, and finally, the, the, uh, the second piece of the puzzle, uh, which is probably the most important, this is how do we get the bounds uh, for, for the, en the, the entropy rate when we actually use the protocol. Okay, so this is maybe the most complicated part, um, but we solved this problem um, in a different work, in a previous work. So um, the solution here is based on, on these two works, so a simple die device independent security proofs uh, that was together with Renato Renner and Thomas Wittig uh, and entropy accumulation, um, which is a work by Frederick Dupi, Omar Fazi and Renato Renner. Uh, we developed these two things such that here we have some mathematical tool, new mathematical tool that I, I will uh, explain more or less what it is. Uh, we developed this such that we can actually use it in, in those kind of applications. So this was uh, a previous work, and now we basically uh, adapt this, uh, the technique that we had here for the case where we have the SV source. Okay, um, so just let me explain what, is the, what was the problem, why it's not trivial to get this bound uh, on a total amount of entropy. So what I showed you also in the previous slide is that, okay, if we know what is the winning probability of the box, then we know how much entropy we have. Right, but I mean, we start with a box, we have no idea what's going on, so in particular, we don't know what is the winning probability. Okay, so how can we get the, the amount of entropy? The trivial uh, thing to do is to um, go into the IID assumption. Okay, so uh, IID, it's um, um, identical and uh, independently distributed. Okay, so here what we have is that basically we assume that we have now many copies of these boxes, okay, and they're all independent and, and identical of one another. Okay, so now I can play the game. I can play a first game with this box, the second game with this box, but they're completely independent. So one box, the, how one box behaves is completely independent of the other ones, and they all behave the same. But it's, I, I guess it's kind of intuitive that if we are in this scenario, then I, I can now just, you know, I, I play the game independently, then I estimate the average winning probability, um, and the winning probability in just one device like this 
um, I have it's a good estimation. Now I can I know how much entropy I have just from a single uh, box like this using the, the the single round case. Okay, and because they are all uh, independent, and what it means is that the total amount of amount of entropy is roughly uh, the number of devices, the number of games, the number of boxes here times the entropy for one game. Okay, so I, I guess this is kind of intuitive to you that. So um, this is roughly the, the exact statement. Uh, you can you can actually do it with um, with something called the quantum asymptotic partition property. So there is also a classical uh, classical asymptotic partition property. Um, this is basically a relation between um, the total smooth mean entropies of all of the outputs. Okay. So in the IID case, it says that um, we can relate the total smooth mean entropy. Um, to n times the von, Neu uh, von Neumann Shannon entropy in the classical case, okay, to the uh, to the this entropy of just a single round, okay, minus some correction term that scales uh, like square root uh, of n, okay. So basically, it means okay in first order, um, the smooth mean entropy is just n times the 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 von Neumann entropy, the Shannon entropy, okay. And this is, this is exactly what we had in mind. We said, okay, we calculate the entropy for just one round. This is easy. This we can do. And then we just multiply by n. Okay? So in a sense, what it is, it's like saying that the total entropy um, is the sum of its part. Okay? So for the, for the, for the Shannon entropy, this is, you can just apply the chain rule. This is, this is trivial. But um, what we need is the smooth mean, smooth mean entropy in order to extract the randomness. So we, we need a statement for this. This is what this asymptotic repetition property is doing. Okay, um, but of course we don't have this IID case. The IID case is not realistic. The device is not going to work this way. Even in the honest case, we have you know things change over time, and there is some memory in the device. Um, so the most general thing that we do need to consider is is the following: the sequential case. So we think of it as having one big component for each for each party, um, but we're going to interact with it sequentially. So we we first play the first game. So we input x1, y1. Um, then we get outputs a1, b1, and only then we continue for the second game. So then we have x2, y2, uh, a2, b2, uh, and so on. Okay, um, so this is a sequential interaction over time, um, and this uh, the statement of this entropy accumulation uh, work is basically an extension uh, of this of this statement. Okay, so a relation of the smooth mean entropy uh, to the to the von Neumann entropy um, for processes which are not IID, but processes which are sequential, and they should have also some, um, some specific properties that we, we have in these kind of protocols. Okay, so it's not for any sequential process, but uh, for many relevant sequential processes, we can still show a statement which is uh, roughly the same. Okay, so in particular, the first order term scales like the, the von Neumann entropy of a single round quantity, okay, and the second order term uh, scales as square root n. Okay? So, um, Yes, I didn't explain exactly what the statement is. This, this by itself will take me another hour. Uh, but if someone is interested, then, then let me know, and I, I'm happy to explain later on. Um, but what is the big picture? So basically what we showed is that, OK, in the IID case, it's kind of clear that if we have um, this, once we understand the, you know, the physics, the uh, entropy in a single device, then we can understand the IID case. And what we show here is that the same holds also for the sequential case. OK, so from here we can get also the sequential case. And in our case, it means, OK, once we have this plot for the bounds just for the entropy from the violation of a single round, then we can derive the rates that I showed you for the, the, the smooth mean entropy rates. OK, so this is how we get them. Good. So to summarize, um, so what we have is a device-independent randomness amplification and privatization protocol uh, that overcomes all of the drawbacks of previous works. So in particular, this is the first one that can actually we can try to go uh, and implement in a lab. Um, the proof is completely new, so these kind of things, uh, it was impossible to derive them with the previous uh, proofs. Um, so it's the first time that we use this measurement uh, dependent locality uh, inequalities uh, in the cryptographic setting. Um, we accommodate for the, for the bias and the correlations in the bit when we calculate the total amount of smooth entropy with this uh, previous technique that we developed. And it's the first application uh, of quantum proof multi-source extractors uh, in the Markov model. Um, there are obviously some many interesting, uh, many interesting open questions left. So uh, we do think it should be possible to get even better extraction rates. So there are uh, several steps that one uh, might be able to, uh, to improve. Um, 
the most interesting question is whether we can, uh, we can extend this not to work just with any SSV source, but with a mean entropy source. Uh, this is also not a trivial thing. Um, and uh, whether we can have quantum side information about the source. Okay, so right now in my model we have lambda is a classical side information about the source, and E, which is the quantum side information, you can think of it as the side information about the device. Yeah, we would like, it's not even clear what the model should look like, but uh, it can be interesting to think what will be the correct model to, to consider such that we also allow for lambda, which is uh, quantum. Okay? Good. Thank you very much.